cool. One of the most forbidding places on Earth, the high Arctic. Bitterly cold, with winter months when the sun never appears above the horizon and summers when it never sets. Even in these harsh surroundings, wildlife thrives. Each species is specially adapted to meet the conditions this chilling environment imposes. Offshore, the drifting pack ice is home to animals which find their food in the rich waters of the Arctic seas. But there's one animal which epitomizes life in the frozen north more than any other. Yet in evolutionary terms, it's a relative newcomer here. Some 250,000 years ago, a race of bears evolved which could cope with life in this bleak setting. In the process, they underwent considerable changes. But the magnificent animal which resulted has become the undisputed symbol of the Arctic. The polar bear is essentially a creature of the ice. The soles of its broad padded feet are furred to prevent them from freezing and to allow better purchase on slippery surfaces. And it's a powerful swimmer, too. It's able to withstand long periods immersed in bitterly cold water because its skin is insulated with a thick layer of fat. The polar bear is a marvelous example of an animal totally in tune with its environment.
Polar bears are found right across the top of the world. Their movements are governed by the drifting ice and the ocean currents. The southerly boundary of their range coincides with the extreme limit of the Arctic pack ice, their true home. Polar bears actually live within the territories of five different nations. They're found off the north and northwest coasts of Alaska in the United States, in Canada, Greenland, closely tied to Denmark, the Svalbard Islands under Norway's jurisdiction, and in the Soviet Union. But bears don't occur everywhere throughout this vast area. Recent research indicates there are a number of main populations which are largely separate from each other. Polar bears direct their wanderings to the active ice where their main prey, seals, are commonest. This one is using its excellent sense of smell to find a bearded seal. When seals are plentiful, a bear normally kills one every few days. This time, its stalk was unsuccessful. During the early spring, polar bears prey extensively on young ringed seals. The pups are born in chambers under the snow. Bears are quick to scent out these birth lairs and dig out the occupants. <laughs> when a bear kills a seal, it normally only eats the blubber giving seabirds and arctic foxes an opportunity to scavenge the leavings. The arctic fox is the polar bear's jackal. Many follow the bears far out onto the ice and probably rely on them exclusively for their livelihood. Though seals form the bear's main prey, walruses are occasionally taken too, but only when a bear can catch an unguarded calf. The bear's sudden approach panics the walrus herd into the water. In the headlong rush to safety, the calves sometimes get left behind. A polar bear's incredibly strong neck muscles allow it to drag several hundred pounds of skin and blubber across the ice with ease. During midwinter, polar bears live in a world of twilight and darkness. But they continue hunting, relying on scent and light reflection from the snow to guide them. They also dig temporary shelters to escape the worst of the winter blizzards. While most bears spend the winter roaming the pack ice, the majority of pregnant females move back to land where they dig snow dens in preparation for the birth of cubs in December and January. Dens are usually sited on the leeward side of cliffs and valleys where the snow cover is deepest. Early in the new year, the sun once again appears above the horizon. During the weeks of darkness, the mother polar bear has remained in her den suckling her newborn cubs. But as the hours of daylight lengthen, 
and more light filters through the snow, she becomes increasingly active. Finally, in March or early April, the day comes when she decides it's time to emerge. And soon after, she calls out her cubs. Despite her long winter fast, the female doesn't begin searching for food immediately. For a week or more, she continues to use the winter den as her base. It gives the cubs a chance to accustom themselves to the outside world and gain strength through their explorations and play. She often excavates hollows nearby where she suckles her young. Twins represent the normal litter, but polar bears often give birth to a single cub and more rarely triplets. Finally, the time comes when the mother bear decides to vacate the den site for good. She's eager to head out to the ice where she can hunt seals. And now the cubs are strong enough to make the journey. The bear's departure leaves the den site free for inspection. It's in a typical situation, a snow bank where the female excavated a tunnel several yards long. Those furrows on the ceiling show where the bear clawed away more snow during her confinement. At the end of the tunnel lies the chamber where in midwinter she gave birth to her tiny blind cubs. Most females den on land and the family may have to trek several miles to reach the ceiling grounds out on the ice. The mother is very hungry now but she must temper her eagerness for prey, for the cubs still can't travel very fast. Every so often, she has to stop to give them a rest and a chance to suckle. Hunger soon has the family on the move again. The bears normally reach the ice within a day or so of leaving the den. They're heading for the area of active ice. Its most distinctive feature is the shear zone, the transition point between shore fast ice joined to the land and the moving ice beyond. Here, vertical ridges of ice may extend for miles parallel to the shore. During autumn, when the drifting ice and water offshore begin to refreeze, it's temporarily prevented from becoming bound to the solid ice inshore by powerful ocean currents. 
the action of currents and wind, exert forces which produce pressure ridges, enormous walls of jumbled ice which can be over 50 feet high. The movements of the ice also produce stretches of open water called leads. Off the north coast of Alaska, they're the favorite haunt of seals. In the spring, they form an important hunting ground for polar bears, too. Alaska's coast and offshore waters are the home of several thousand bears. Part of this population is being closely monitored by wildlife authorities. In spring and autumn, when the bears are hunting seals relatively close inshore, it's possible to locate them by tracking from a helicopter. The polar bear research program in Alaska includes tagging and marking bears in order to study their movements. A tranquilizing dart is the safest and most efficient method of immobilizing a bear. This large male may weigh over a thousand pounds, but within minutes he's fully sedated. Project leader Steve Amstrup administers an injection of penicillin to the bear as a safety precaution. Now the team prepare to start their work. Numbered tags are placed in the bear's ears. Made of durable plastic, they're a permanent means of future identification and they won't harm the bear. As a further permanent record, the inside of the upper lip is inscribed with a tattoo. Painting a serial number on the bear's rump serves for long distance recognition. It's only a temporary measure, for in the coming months, the bear will molt its fur and the number will gradually be lost. Now it's going to be weighed. For the heaviest bears, the easiest way is to use the helicopter.
The team complete their checks by taking a small sample of blood for analysis. Then the bear is injected with an antidote to revive it. Recovery is remarkably sudden, and the bear is none the worse for its unusual experience. But things don't always go quite so smoothly. When the research team dart an adult female, they don't realize they've got company. Spring is the polar bear's mating time. This huge male has been following the female, and now a confrontation is unavoidable. Steve, get back. I think he's coming. Steve Amstrup fires a warning shot over the bear's head. But he isn't scared. He means to find out exactly what's happened to his consort. A hurried signal to start the helicopter engines. Suddenly it's turned into a very awkward situation. The team need to finish working on the darted female as soon as possible, but the male won't back off. In his agitated state, he's also highly unpredictable and most certainly dangerous. The main hope now is that the noise of the helicopter will frighten him away. Fortunately, it worked but not without its moments of anxiety for the research team. In situations like this, it's easy to see how the polar bear acquired its fearsome reputation. It's quite the most powerful and impressive predator in the whole of the Arctic. The polar bear's world is the land of ice and snow. Several thousand miles to the east of Alaska lie the Svalbard Islands, far to the north of Norway. Svalbard used to be known as Spitsbergen, after the largest island in the group. The protection of Svalbard's wildlife, including its polar bears, is the responsibility of Norway. The climate and terrain of the Svalbard Islands vary dramatically from east to west. Until recently, polar bears suffered extensive hunting in many parts of their range. In Svalbard alone, an average of over 300 was taken annually, most of them with the use of the set gun, which the bear triggered itself by pulling on a bait attached to the gun. The evidence can still be seen, but in 1970, Norway outlawed the use of these traps. Three years later, polar bear hunting in Svalbard was banned altogether. Today, teams from the Norwegian Polar Institute visit Svalbard waters in the research vessel Lance. During the summer months, the ship is used as a base for scientific studies of the rich and abundant offshore wildlife. Research on polar bears is high on the list of the Institute's priorities. The Barents Sea now contains one of the highest populations in the world, but more knowledge of the movements of these bears is very important if future management and conservation is to be effective. The Norwegians are currently engaged in a program of catching bears and fitting them with experimental radio collars in order to follow their travels.
Landing a helicopter on the unstable summer ice would be hazardous, so the team uses an inflatable Zodiac dinghy for the pursuit. Every effort is made to tranquilize the bear as quickly as possible to avoid exhausting it during a long chase. The bear hardly notices when it's been hit by the dart. It's important the researchers don't lose track of the bear among the maze of ice flows. They want to make sure it's out of the water before it becomes sedated, so it's vital to head it back onto the ice. Now the team can move in. Expedition leader Tor Larsen checks that it's really unconscious. With the bear safely darted, Lance can move in closer. It's going to be hoisted on board ship. Before scientific checks are carried out, it's moved into a specially constructed cage on the deck. Tor Larsen is preparing to fit a shoulder harness onto the bear. This has been designed to carry a prototype collar containing a satellite transmitter. With the harness and collar in place, the bear is left quietly to come round from the tranquilizer. Despite its unusual surroundings, it's remarkably calm and even accepts a drink of water. The bear will stay in the cage for 24 hours. That gives the researchers time to make absolutely sure the collar is fitted properly and will not impede the bear's movement but it doesn't even seem to notice the strange apparatus. By the following day, the bear is fully recovered and very keen to get back onto the ice. The team are satisfied that the collar and harness aren't worrying it, so they prepare for its release.
The bear will wear its collar for a year. Then the harness is designed to break up and fall off. In the meantime, it will transmit signals which are bounced by satellite to a receiver in France and then relayed to the Institute's computers in Oslo. The satellite tracking of polar bears is still in its infancy, but if successful, it will enable their movements in places where conventional radio tracking is impossible to be studied. Though polar bears are typically animals of the high Arctic, their range encompasses some areas which lie well to the south of the Arctic Circle. Hudson Bay in Canada is an example. Its southern shores are almost on the same latitude as London, yet the bay contains a resident population of polar bears. During the summer months, as the ice melts, the bears are forced to move ashore. On land, the bears have to rely on their fat reserves to tide them through a long period when they're denied their staple diet of seals. This fast is occasionally broken by brief meals on roots, bulbs, even birds' eggs and small mammals. But it's something of a mystery how they can survive for months without really eating. One factor is that because they're in a state of relative inactivity, the bears expend very little energy. Polar bears are normally solitary creatures, but in Hudson Bay, they're often found living close together, particularly in autumn, when they head towards areas like Cape Churchill to await the first freeze-up of the winter ice. In situations like this, the largest bears are normally dominant. But there's little real aggression. The younger bears are quick to recognize their superiors and they beat a retreat whenever necessary. It's very unusual to see polar bears behaving like this. But on the shores of Hudson Bay, they have plenty of time to indulge in mock fighting while waiting for the bay to freeze. These bears are simply testing each other's strength. But during the mating season in spring, males often engage in serious battles for females. South of Cape Churchill lies an important denning area, 
where numbers of females give birth to their cubs each winter. With a summer influx of other bears, mothers with cubs tend to retreat inland, for adult males will sometimes kill small cubs. Cubs born on the coast of Hudson Bay experience a very different environment from their counterparts further north. They are often attracted to small frozen ponds, for even here they are naturally fascinated by their traditional medium, the ice. After several months living away from the cleansing effects of ice and water, the bear's coats become heavily soiled. But with a return to winter conditions, they'll soon whiten up again. Although Hudson Bay's coastline seems a far from typical setting for polar bears, it appears to suit them remarkably well. Females here produce and raise triplets more frequently than anywhere else, and researchers have also found that cubs born in Hudson Bay often become independent of their mothers before they're two years old, several months earlier than is normal in the more rigorous conditions of the Arctic. These cubs are in their first year. They're still entirely dependent on their mother to nourish them, and they'd be unable to survive without her. After they've finished suckling, the cubs sample some kelp. In Hudson Bay, bears often scavenge along the shoreline. As autumn progresses, more and more assemble at Cape Churchill and other promontories to await the freezing of the bay. Freezing takes place first around headlands and sheltered bays, so the bears make for these places. They're eager to get out onto the ice to resume seal hunting. Often, they're too impatient. The ice still isn't firm enough to hold their weight.
eventually the time comes when the bay is solidly frozen. Then, within a matter of days, the bears leave the land for their hunting grounds. Only pregnant females remain to await the birth of cubs in their maternity dens. Hudson Bay represents a remarkable and unusual habitat for polar bears. In most of their range, these animals are found living far to the north of human habitation. To coastal Arctic peoples, like the Eskimos of Alaska, Canada and Greenland, the polar bear is an important part of their heritage. They've long prized the bear's magnificent creamy white pelt for its warmth and its meat for food. In modern times, mechanized hunting of polar bears, both commercially and for sport, has had a more serious impact in some parts of their range. The nature of its environment means that contact between the polar bear and man is still limited. Yet for an animal which is relatively rarely seen in its natural state, it's a remarkably familiar figure. Its commanding appearance, coupled with the ease and grace with which it roams the drifting pack ice, have captured our imagination. Although overhunting is largely a thing of the past, polar bears now face a greater threat. Petroleum exploration and development is firmly established in the Arctic. Prudhoe Bay, an oil field on the northern coast of Alaska, is an example. What began as development in a limited coastal area has now spread in all directions. Access roads and connecting pipelines feed the main Alaska pipeline through which oil from Prudhoe Bay is fed almost a thousand miles to Alaska's southern coast. exploration isn't confined to onshore regions. This man-made island was recently constructed north of Prudhoe Bay to house an offshore drilling rig. 
Offshore drilling and seismic testing pose new threats to the bears, to the areas they use for denning, and to their main prey species, the seals. And it would be disastrous if a major oil spill occurred offshore under the ice. Wildlife authorities in Alaska are aware of these problems. So it's important that scientists quickly gain a better understanding of how the bears could be affected. This necessitates studying not only the bears themselves, but animals like seals on which they prey. For the polar bear, at the top of the food chain, is only one in a long line of creatures which would suffer from the environmental changes that adverse development and pollution of the Arctic could cause. Alaska's bears represent only a percentage of the total population. It's currently estimated that between 20 to 40,000 polar bears are spread across the top of the globe. Their conservation is an international concern. Earlier this century, the numbers of bears declined rapidly as a result of man's increasing presence in the Arctic. But in 1972, the five polar bear nations negotiated a treaty for the further preservation of this unique animal. It was aimed at curbing excessive hunting, protecting bears and their habitat, and coordinating research efforts. We've seen something of how Alaska and Norway are currently studying bears. Canada, the Soviet Union and Greenland have their own research programs too. Thanks to this remarkable international effort, polar bear populations are now stable and some are even on the increase again. But all living things ultimately depend for their future on man's ability to respect the harmony of the environment. The polar bear symbolizes the spirit of one of the last great wildernesses on Earth. Long may it continue to reign supreme in its ice-bound home. This Sunday at 8, the Call of the Wild delves into the life of an animal born smaller than a thimble that grows into a red kangaroo.